Salem, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the May, May 2018 Public Safety News Conference for the City of Winston-Salem. The running order this morning will be the Fire Department followed by the Winston-Salem Police Department and then Winston-Salem for Scythe County Emergency Management. Uh, I have a couple of announcements from the Fire Department this morning uh, in, an, in an effort uh, for last push in our current recruiting process. We uh, extended the deadline to apply for a firefighter position for 10 additional days and that hiring process is open through midnight tonight. Today is May 9th for you all who may be watching this recorded. Um, you can visit, the, the easiest way to do it is to go to the city's website and into the human resources page and then up at the top there is a link to job postings and you can drill down into that that firefighter job posting and uh, it, it can all be done online. <clears throat> we also, uh, we had uh, three fire stations that underwent a significant amount of work. One was completely replaced and two went through major overhauls uh, as uh, part of the projects associated with the 2014 bond package that the voters approved and Fire Station 9, located at 4685 Ogburn Avenue, will have a ribbon cutting on that facility. That facility is open and operating now, but we're going to make it official on May 17th at 1 p.m., and we would encourage uh, interested parties to come out and join us for that. <clears throat> we have, uh, the next thing I'm going to do is, is uh, give some commendations this morning to some individuals who were involved in uh, some heroic efforts, uh, saving the life of a fire victim on March 7th at Bathabra Village Apartments. Uh, the, uh, now, <clears throat> those of you who, who, who attend this regularly or watch know that I'm good for giving a lecture when given an opportunity, and this morning will be no different. Uh, so the fire was reported by a tenant, and, and for the information that I have, the tenant reported the fire to the office at the apartment complex and we do not recommend that we recommend that if you think there is a fire you see a fire you need to report any emergency that you dial 911 because if you dial any number other than 911 it delays the appropriate response of resources whether they be fire police or medical uh, but upon the office being notified apartment manager nancy plowden and maintenance worker christian coleman went to the apartment to check out uh, what was going on there and, and when they opened the door they were greeted with heavy smoke conditions. Uh, with the door open, uh, residents who, who were in nearby apartments, Bryant Marsh and Russell McKissick, went inside the apartment and removed the victim who is still recovering. And the victim's daughter uh, is, is, has joined us. She's in the audience today. Now, the intent of this news conference is to inform the public and I'll tell you that while we appreciate the efforts put forth by these four individuals we do not condone these actions uh, and, and I've I struggled uh, in my mind as to whether we were going to give a recognition or not because we do not want to encourage people to do this uh, and, and it's because of the risk involved there is a significant risk involved with entering in a, any kind of structure that is on fire and we do not encourage people who are not trained and equipped to do that uh, to make that sort of entry. Fire behavior, because of the proliferation of synthetics in the modern fire environment, is completely unpredictable, far less predictable than it was 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, and, and conditions can change literally in, the matter of sec in a matter of seconds. And smoke conditions could become untenable or uh, somebody who has made entry without proper training and equipment uh, could be cut off from their exit uh, by fire. Uh, and and I, I want to stress, this can happen. We have seen it happen. Uh, laboratory tests show that it happens in a matter of seconds. Uh, and, and this fire is a good example of how unknown conditions can change because in this apartment there were oxygen cylinders present and two of those, two of the uh, pressure, overpressure devices on those oxygen cylinders released just as firefighters were 
we're making entry. And I don't know if you've ever seen fire burn in the presence of oxygen, uh, but it is quite impressive. Uh, a lot of people think oxygen is a flammable gas. It is not. Oxygen is a non-flammable gas, but it is an oxidizer, and it is the best oxidizer known to man, and it will make fire burn like you could not imagine. Um, so again, now let's step down off my soapbox, end of lecture. Uh, you know, I, I am pleased to say that fortunately in this case, uh, we got away with it, uh, and, and we are going to recognize these four individuals uh, for the personal risk they assume in saving the life of another. So if I can get uh, Nancy, Christian, Bryant, and Russell, if you'll come up on stage and, and receive your certificates of commendation. So this certificate of commendation states, uh, you are hereby recognized and applauded for your quick and decisive emergency actions to assist in the rescue of your fellow citizen on March 7, 2018, signed by W.L. Mayo, Fire Chief, and J. Allen Jones, Mayor of the City of Winston-Salem. Congratulations. Thank you for, for the sacrifice you made uh, and, and the risk you assumed in saving the life of, of a neighbor. Um, before the fire department arrived, uh, we just like any other emergency service, we don't have a fire station on every corner. So um, when when citizens take action, although uh, in this case, assuming probably more risk than you should have, but again, we got away with it, and I applaud your effort. Thank you. So next up for us will be Assistant Chief and Fire Marshal Tad Byram. Uh, he's going to give some updates. We've had uh, 13 building fires in the last 10 days and two cooking fires uh, since, that will be since Monday, April 30th. Uh, and that's, that's a little more frequent than we would experience, uh, than, than we would expect to experience building fires. Um, but, but Chief Byram's going to kind of bring that into perspective for you. And uh, he has some video to show and a PowerPoint. And then after Chief Byram, Fire and Life Safety Educator, Sabrina Stowe is going to come up and talk about grilling safety uh, as, as the weather warms and folks dust off their grills and, and get them out. She's going to talk about grilling safety. And then she's also going to talk about smoke alarms. Thank you, Chief Mayo. Uh, first, we're going to start off with uh, some video footage of three of the fires. Um, our, our personnel, uh, currently some of them have uh, cameras that they attach to their uh, fire helmets, and we're able to get video from when they arrive and as they start fighting the fire and stuff like that. So um, we'll go ahead and sh look at some brief clips, and then I'll speak to each fire individually. Um, in that uh, particular video, that was 5435 Bex Church Road. Um, Engine 14 was the first due company there. They're uh, based at Chatillon near University Parkway. Um, you can see in that video, uh, they were using a, a new nozzle that uh, we're starting to deploy on our uh, fire engine so that we can make a, a quick rapid attack and knock the fire down because obviously the best thing you can do on a fire is put water on it as fast as possible. 
Uh, that fire was controlled in about 20 minutes uh, by 31 personnel. And this was caused by a smoldering towel that had been disposed in a recycle bin outside. Uh, it was used to wrap a potato that was in the microwave. It was cooked too long and uh, they discarded the towel there in the recycle bin and that ignited the uh, materials that were in the bin uh, unbeknownst to them while they were inside <laughs> going about their uh, business. So uh, we'll go with the next video. Okay, um, that particular video, uh, that came from 146 Barlow Circle on May 3rd. Uh, it was, fire came in at 112 p.m. It took 30 minutes to control this fire uh, by 24 personnel. Uh, this one was actually due to an electrical cause. It was a short in a ceiling fan. Next, please. Uh, this particular fire was at 206 North Laura Wall Boulevard. Uh, uh, we responded at 2.57 a.m. Uh, when the fire department arrived, they already had heavy fire conditions. Uh, typically, when we get fires uh, in the middle of the night, a lot of times they are in an advanced condition because you don't have the motoring public and people out there walking around to observe things and report them quickly. Uh, so that fire took five hours to control, it took a total of 43 personnel. So what we want to do is break down some of the data right here. Um, through our Twitter and through uh, the media, um, we, we try to get these fires out in the public eye. Uh, we want the public to know about fires because that's, you know, part of our fire prevention efforts, you know when they see that there's actually a risk, then hopefully uh, they respond appropriately. Uh, but by doing so, sometimes it seems like we're having maybe a rash of fires or inordinate amount of fires. But the uh, statistics, the actual data does not bear that out in this case. Um, what we're doing is we're gonna look at data from January 1st, 2018 to May 6, 2018. And we're also going to compare that to the similar time frame in 2017. And what we're going to do is give you data for the uh, property types affected and for the fire causes. Okay, uh, you can see by this chart here, um, we have a comparison of 2017 to 2018. Uh, structure fires, you can see we are actually down by seven uh, for the same time frame. Uh, cooking fires, where uh, we actually have three more cooking fires, uh, we have six more vehicle fires, uh, but we have four fewer uh, brush fires, woods fires, grass fires, things that occur in natural vegetation. Uh, and you can see our totals were down by two. So statistically speaking, you know, there's really nothing there to show that we're having a rash or a spike in fires. Uh, as far as the fire causes, um, right now, you know, we have 4% intentionally set fires compared to 8% at the same time last year, 44% uh, unintentional compared to 61%, um, failure of equipment or heat source, we're up there, and then as far as fires under investigation, uh, we're up there, but that's not unusual for this time of year. We're only halfway into the year, and sometimes it takes months for us to actually establish a fire cause. And that's a map that shows the distribution of our fires, and this is really 
not unusual for our fire distribution. Um, the red ones uh, would be structure fires, uh, fires occurring in houses, businesses, so on and so forth. Uh, your blue ones indicate vehicle fires, could be a passenger car, could be a uh, commercial vehicle. Um, also, and then the green indicates your natural vegetation fires, brush, grass, woods, so on and so forth. Um, we've also had data run uh, by our uh, friends in the police department with our uh, crime analyst group, and we have found no correlation in any of these fires. We found nothing unusual there. So as far as our conclusions uh, so thus far, uh, we don't have any significant differences in the number of fires or our fire causes. Uh, and see, as stated before, we actually have two fewer fires at this point, six fewer structure fires, four fewer vegetation fires, and four fewer intentionally set fires, or 4%, I should say, intentionally set fires. So I mentioned, you know, fire safety awareness earlier. The best fire is the one that doesn't happen, <laughs> obviously. Um, so we highly suggest that you have working smoke detectors or smoke alarms on every floor. They need out, one outside the sleeping areas and one inside each bedroom, and that's per NFPA 72, which covers uh, fire alarms. Um, you know, the best thing you can have for your safety, for your personal safety, for your family's safety, is working smoke alarms. Uh, practice escape drills, okay? It's great to have the smoke alarms, but what do you do when the alarm goes off? Uh, you need to practice these as a family. Uh, no two ways out of the structure. Uh, have a meeting place so that everybody can be accounted for. Uh, our number one fire cause in Winston-Salem, and this is also nationally the number one fire cause, is unattended cooking. So uh, we say watch what you heat. You know, when you turn on the stove, stay by the stove. Don't leave the stove. I know it's easy to get distracted these days with cell phones and kids and uh, TV and everything else, but uh, that stove's probably the most dangerous thing you got in your house. <laughs> um, discard cigarettes in a safe manner. You know, just don't, uh, throw them out on the ground or wherever, you know, put them in an, uh, an appropriate uh, receptacle. Of course, uh, keep matches, lighters away from miners. Um, we encourage you that using, uh, say, licensed and reputable contractors for doing any electrical work. Um, in my opinion, you know, electrical work is one of those things that's best up to the uh, experts uh, because a mistake can have dire consequences. Uh, keep candles away from anything that can burn. You know, you, you can go to about any uh, big box store, uh, drug store, we got specialty stores that all sell candles. You know, we all like candles because they're pretty and they make things smell good and all that, but they're a significant source of heat. Uh, you know, they can set fire to things nearby, uh, so don't leave them unattended. Uh, keep them away from miners. You know, uh, miners can have a little fascination with these things. You know, if, if kids are into them, we suggest you go get the LED type candles. You know, they're safe. Okay. Um, so now, uh, one thing I want to speak to is uh, the issue of boarding houses, rooming houses, and uh, vacant, vacant structures. Uh, a significant amount of our work actually occurs in vacant properties. Uh, so we're actually seeking your help <laughs> to help us with uh, preventing these fires. Uh, as far as boarding or rooming houses go, uh, these are regulated by uh, our Office of Community Development. Uh, the fire department has no jurisdiction in uh, one and two family homes. Uh, the fire code does not cover those, so we can't go into single family dwellings and do fire inspections or expect <laughs> compliance there. Uh, but a boarding or rooming house 
it's a structure it's originally built as a single family dwelling or house and it has been modified expanded uh, reconfigured uh, or reconstructed to have one or more separate living units um, a boarding house is occupied by an owner who rents out rooms a rooming house is going to be one where rooms are rented out but the owner doesn't actually live there um, and in Winston-Salem, you know, a single family house, that's gonna be one that has no more than four unrelated adults, 18 years or older, plus their children. Uh, as far as uh, zoning goes, they're gonna be allowed in any RS zoning district. Uh, so also, you know, our inspections and zoning department uh, can get involved with these things. Um, things to look for. Uh, if it's in your neighborhood, you suspect something's going on. If you've got multiple vehicles parked there all the time, uh, you see different people in and out of there, um, you know, things that just don't look right. Uh, you, you know, if you suspect that it may be a boarding house, uh, you can report that to our Office of uh, Community Development. Or if you see anything that you consider to be suspicious activity, certainly, you know, you can report that uh, to the police department. Um, as far as vacant structures go, uh, like I said, we do have a significant number of fires and vacant structures. Uh, if you happen to own a vacant a structure that's vacant, uh, we implore you to secure this structure, uh, to make sure that you take necessary steps to keep unwanted people out of there. Um, you know, they tend to be um, magnets, I guess, <laughs> for uh, some folks in our community. Uh, you know, and we don't know if people are in there. That's a hazard uh, to our firefighters when they arrive on the scene, you know, whether or not we have to make that call to do a rescue or, you know, fight this fire from the outside in a safe manner. Uh, and like I said, if you see anything that uh, makes you think you may have a illegal boarding house or rooming house in your neighborhood, uh, you can call CityLink at 311, uh, or you can call them at 336-727-8000, or you can also use the CityLink app. And so that concludes uh, my portion of the program. I'm gonna turn it over. Oh, uh, any questions at this time? I'm going to uh, turn it over to our senior educator, Sabrina Stowe. Good morning. Just want to um, talk about a few things with the weather finally breaking and Memorial Day coming up. We're probably going to have a lot more people getting on their grills. And we just wanted to talk a little bit about some grilling safety tips. Um, just in general, and you know, it seems like common sense, but we need to make sure that we advise people that you do need to make sure you're only using the grills outdoors. Um, believe it or not, that is an issue with some people. Make sure that those grills are going to be placed well away from the home, um, free, clear of any deck railings, out from under the eaves, and even um, the overhanging branches. You want to make sure, just like inside of your cooking area in the kitchen, you want to keep your children and your pets at least three feet away from that area. Definitely want to make sure your grill is clean and um, ready to be used um, before you um, light it up. And just as with your kitchen, you want to make sure that your grill is never unattended while you're using that. For your charcoal grills, you want to make sure that um, you're using the, rec the, rec the correct kind of fuel, rec the correct kind of starter, if you're using an electric, electric charcoal starter, um, be sure that your extension cord is going to be rated for outdoor use. Always only use starter fluid. Um, no other type of accelerant is going to be appropriate for your grill. You want to keep those fluids away from your children and away from the heat sources as well. When you're done with your um, charcoal grills, you want to make sure that you cool those um, charcoals in a metal container and keep that away from your home as well while that's cooling off. 
on your propane grills, you want to make sure that you check those before um, the, the beginning of your um, grilling season. You want to check those hoses. If you want to do that by <coughs> applying a light soap and water liquid to the hose, if there's any leaks, those will um, release bubbles. Um, if you see that, you want to make sure that you, you know, turn off the grill, check that gas tank, call 911 if there's anything going on, um, and you also want to make sure that you get a professional um, to check that before you use it again if you suspect that there is a leak. If you smell gas while cooking, do not move the grill, call the fire department. Um, if the flame goes out, turn the grill off, wait at least 15 minutes before relighting. Just wanted to mention the North Carolina grilling ordinance about where you can um, use the outside grills, or all the grills are outside. Um, there is a section that prohibits the grills within use within 10 feet of any vertically or horizontally of any combustible materials. And there could be other ordinances or if you're living in apartments and on decks and that type of thing of where you can use those. So if you're in an apartment area, you want to make sure that you're following the rules um, of that complex. And there is more information at this website, excuse me, um, about grilling on patios. Any questions about grilling? One other thing I want to talk about, um, we've talked about different fires that have taken place in the area. Um, we're always preaching about using smoke alarms, using the stovetop cook stops, and that's always going to be um, something that we always preach um, about. We're also going to be partnering with um, the American Red Cross on tomorrow. They have a um, initiative called Sound the Alarm. Um, they have selected several areas in the city that have a high fire rate. We're going to be partnering with them. This is just an area, and I can send this map to you so that you can get a little bit more detail about where we're going to be um, installing those smoke alarms. There are going to be six areas in the East Winston part of the city, um, near Cameron Avenue, um, in the northeast part of the city as well. Um, we're going to have some of our engine company personnel as well, as well as our fire and life safety personnel. We're going to have about 100 volunteers that will be out on tomorrow from 11 a.m. until 2 p.m. installing smoke alarms in any of the homes of the residents um, that are there and want those smoke alarms installed. So anyone would like to join us, we will be leaving from um, our Beatty Training Center from um, at 1200 North Patterson Avenue. We will be um, convening there 10 o'clock and leaving to install the smoke alarms at 11. Um, does anyone have any questions about that? There. How can they reach? They can contact me um, here at the fire department, or you can contact Margaret Erge at the Red Cross. Um, our number here, 336-773-7900. Um, if we go to the homes and people are not there, we will be leaving some contact information where they can reach us if we're not able to install the smoke alarms tomorrow. Um, Winston-Salem Fire Department will go back and, and get those smoke alarms installed. Thank you. Next, we will have Police Chief Katrina Thompson with some information from the Police Department. Thank you, Sabrina. Good morning. I am Police Chief Katrina Thompson, and on behalf of the women and men of the Winston-Salem Police Department, I too would like to welcome you to the May 2018 Public Safety News Conference. I especially want to acknowledge and recognize Councilmember John Larson for joining us this morning. Please join me in honoring our fallen officer for the month of May who paid the ultimate sacrifice. Patrolman Michael M. Vickers, end of watch, May 19th, 1895. Patrolman Vickers was shot and killed by a man during an altercation while he was on patrol. The suspect was angry because another police officer had just been acquitted of the death of the suspect's brother one year earlier. The suspect was convicted of second degree murder and sentenced to 25 years in prison. Now please join me in a moment of silence to honor Patrolman Michael Vickers 
as well as all of the women and men across our country who's paid the ultimate sacrifice. Thank you. Before I begin with upcoming events, I would like to thank the women and men of the Winston-Salem Police Department for their hard work and dedication and for protecting and serving the citizens of Winston-Salem every day. National Police Week will be recognized this year from May 13th to May 19th, and May 15th is National Peace Officers Memorial Day of Recognition. Members of the Winston-Salem Police Department will join me for Ladies' Tea Time on June 4th from noon until 2 o'clock p.m. at the United Metropolitan Missionary Baptist Church located at 450 Metropolitan Drive. This is an event that is open to the public and all are welcome. Next up on the police agenda will be FSB investigator Stephen Horsley who will discuss auto breaking and theft prevention. Followed by Traffic Enforcement Unit Officer Bradley Richardson, who will discuss motorcycle awareness. Lieutenant John Morris will then come up and discuss laws regarding all-terrain vehicles. And he will be followed by Park Ranger Ralph Mason to discuss picnic area shelter rentals as well as pool openings. Investigator Horsley. Good morning. Uh, again, I'm Investigator Stephen Horsley of the one Salem Police Department. Uh, I'm the District 3 District Investigator with the Field Services Bureau. And once again, I've come before you to talk about auto break-ins and locking your cars. Well, I've also come to talk about the 9 p.m. routine that everybody's been buzzing about. The uh, hashtag that's kind of taken over and everybody's been calling about. What is the 9 p.m. routine? It's a simple message to remind folks not to be the victim of a crime of opportunity. The 9 p.m. routine is very simple, and it might sound very familiar to a lot of you out there. It basically means to secure your valuables, and as we've talked about before, locking up your purses, your laptops, uh, your firearms, spare keys. Uh, make sure your weapons are secured in a safe and locked place, uh, not in the front seat of your car or under your uh, vehicle uh, seats. Uh, check and make sure that your vehicle doors are locked. Just go out at, at a certain time every night. Uh, when you're getting ready to shut down, make sure that, the, that there's nothing of value. Lock your car doors, secure the vehicle. Then once you go back inside, make sure that your garage door is locked. Make sure your house alarm uh, and doors are secured and you close the blinds. The 9 p.m. routine is that simple. It's just a reminder um, to, uh, it's as simple as checking your doors according to the Pasco County Sheriff's Office in Pasco County, Florida, who developed this. Um, they developed this in about 2016 uh, to just remind uh, citizens to secure the valuables, vehicles, and houses. And since this was implemented within the first year, their calls for service reduced by 30% of the, using this simple reminder in their, uh, with their citizens in their neighborhoods. And uh, this has taken off social media campaign across the country. Um, so we encourage everybody to utilize the 9 p.m. routine. We also encourage everybody to remind their friends, neighbors, tweet it, Facebook it, post it, email it, but, but remind everyone out there to uh, use the 9 p.m. routine. It's a simple way to remember to lock and secure your vehicle, uh, just like right here. Uh, don't forget to lock your car doors. Does anybody have any questions? There's been a, a, a few in decline, yes. We still have people that are leaving their doors unlocked, uh, but we've had neighborhoods where normally we'd have five or six. The ones that I've reviewed in the last few days, we've only had maybe two or three cars in the neighborhood of uh, where there's multiple cars that usually would have been done. Are there any other questions? If there are no further questions, I'd like to uh, call up uh, Officer Richardson. He's going to talk about motorcycle awareness. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Officer Richardson with the Winston-Salem Police Department Traffic Enforcement Unit. Um, this morning, we're going to be speaking on motorcycle awareness. Actually, our governor, Roy Cooper, has proclaimed May as Motorcycle Safety Awareness Month. And as you noticed, in April, we had a lot of rain. And the old saying goes, April showers bring May flowers. Well, 
could also be said that April showers bring May motorcycle riding, and we've seen an increased number of motorcycle riders in the, uh, the past month. So let's just touch on a few highlights this morning about motorcycle safety awareness. First of all, it's, it goes without saying that motorcycle safety is a two-way street. What I mean by that, the motorcyclist has their responsibilities, but also the other drivers have a responsibility as well. So let's just touch on the highlights. First of all, uh, the motorcyclist's responsibility. Um, first and foremost, you need to wear a helmet. And when we mention helmets, the main thing is that, is it a, that it is a DOT approved helmet. Easy way to find out if a helmet is DOT approved, there'll be a sticker similar to the one on the screen there that says DOT certified. Um, that label will be, will be present on all helmets that are, that are acceptable. Also, um, it's, a, it's a good practice to obey all traffic laws and should be properly licensed. It's amazing how many uh, motorcycles we stop and we notice that the motorcyclist is not properly licensed. Um, as you can see in this little, this little video on the right, he's not obeying traffic laws, so we wouldn't encourage that type of riding. Also, a couple, couple things. Uh, motorcyclists, as their responsibility goes, make sure you use turn signals or hand signals when turning or changing lanes. Wear brightly col colored or reflective clothing. As you can see in this picture right here, it was um, uh, Vice President Pence. He, he was uh, making a, a campaign visit, and this picture was taken in, you know, on the runway, and it was completely pitch black, and someone flashed the light, and just a little reflective strip down our pants produced that much light. So a little reflection goes a long way. So uh, make sure that, that you're wearing proper clothing, reflective or brightly colored clothing, um, is very significant in being more visible uh, to other motorists. Also, obey the posted speed limit signs. Um, it's easy on a motorcycle to want to go a little faster than, than you should, so make sure you're obeying the, uh, the speed limit signs. And never di drive distracted or impaired. They say that at a .03, um, signs of impairment can be observed on a motorcycle. And the reason that is, when you're riding a motorcycle, Obviously, you have balance that comes into play when riding, and uh, .03, that, that would be significant, I mean, probably equivalent to drinking one beer or one alcoholic drink, and size, signs of impairment can be observed doing that. So that's just a few highlights on the motorcyclist's responsibility, but also the other driver's responsibility. A couple things to keep in mind as someone in a vehicle, share the road. The motorcyclist has the right to one full lane. Um, check your blind spots for motorcycles. It's easy for a car to get lost in your blind spot, much less a motorcycle. It's a lot, it's a lot easier for a motorcyclist to get uh, lost there. Also, want to mention, if you're a motorcycle rider, don't ride in someone's blind spot. It's, uh, it's not a good practice. Also, provide a safe following distance. It's recommended three to four seconds um, following distance behind a motorcycle. And the reason so is a motorcycle can stop faster than a vehicle can, so give them a little extra space. Obviously, if a car rear ends a motorcycle, the car wins every time, so uh, please give us a three to four second following distance. Also, be cautious of all uh, motorcycle turn signals that some are, are not self-canceling, and what I mean by that, if you cut on your turn signal, sometimes in the newer cars, if it's on for an extended period of time, the turn signal will naturally cut off. On most motorcycles, that's not the case. Um, so they may have a turn signal on, you're thinking they're turning, they're actually not. So just be aware of that. Never drive distracted or drunk, that should go without saying. Also remember, a car versus a motorcycle, the car wins every time. If you notice in these pictures, the motorcyclist, or the motorcycle was on the ground, obviously the rider of that motorcycle uh, has, a, has a personal contact with the ground, and that's, uh, that's never a good day. So. Let's bring some statistics into play here. A motorcyclist, they're five times more likely to be injured in a crash and 29 times more likely to be killed in a crash. Think about that, 29 times more likely to be killed in a crash on a motorcycle compared to in a vehicle. In North Carolina, there was uh, last year, 3,600 motorcycle related crashes. This resulted in 592 serious injuries and 142 traffic fatalities. Now let's bring that uh, a little closer to home. In 2015, we had one motorcycle fatality and two moped 
fatalities and a total of 77 motorcycle related crashes. 2016, we had three motorcycle fatalities, 67 total motorcycle crashes, and in 2017, we had three motorcycle fatalities and 104 total motorcycle crashes. Uh, you know, that, that's just entirely too many. Uh, we're averaging about three a year if you count those two mopeds. Um, so our goal in 2018 is zero. That's what we want. We don't want to see a single motorcyclist get killed uh, in a motorcycle crash. And how can we do that? Well, the Winston-Salem Police Department offers an, a phenomenal program. It's called Bike Safe. Bike Safe is free. Did I mention that it is completely free? All right. Not many things in this uh, world are free, but this class is free, and it's offered by the Winston-Salem Police Department. And basically, it consists of any citizen of Winston-Salem or the surrounding area that has a motorcycle and a proper endorsement. They can show up, sign up on bikesafenc.com. They sign up. They can come to class, and basically, it's, it's at our uh, SOD um, facility, which is at 121 Polo Road. And we have, uh, we have breakfast provided. Then we have a classroom portion, which normally lasts about an hour, hour and a half. And we hone in on some of the more specific um, rider behaviors and statistics, and, and we just throw a lot of information at them. Uh, but we don't stop there. Um, this class is unique because after our classroom portion, we have a short ride, which consists of 15 to 20 minute ride. And what we do, one of our motor officers leads the way. Then we have one of the citizens, they'll ride behind that officer. And then we have another motor officer behind the, the person that signed up for the class. And during this short ride, we observe their rider behaviors, you know, whether how they negotiate curves, how they, their takeoff, braking, uh, lane negotiation, everything like that is involved in this short ride. And then we have a, a, a break for lunch and we review some of their driving mannerisms and say, hey, you may want to improve a little bit here or watch this or do this. And anything we see, give them positive and constructive uh, feedback there. And then after that, once we give them some pointers, we go on a long ride, which consists of about an hour and a half ride. And um, it's, a, it's a really nice rural ride through some, some country curvy roads. So it really uh, helps them put some of the skills that we have taught them and observed into practice. And then afterwards, they get a certificate of completion. And uh, many, many of your insurance companies will uh, use this and, and give their, their um, clients a little break on their insurance as well. So it might be a little kickback of, of doing that. So uh, again, this is a free class offered. Our next class is May 25th. You can go online. It's easy to sign up. It's, did I mention it's free of charge? I think I've mentioned that a few times. Um, so make sure to do that. And of course, this class is offered so we can uh, hit our goal of zero motorcycle fatalities that, this year. We don't want to see a single motorcycle injured and certainly not killed in a crash this year. Are there any questions? Yes. Bruce, uh, how do you differentiate in your training or in this kind of programming uh, for mopeds versus a regular motorcycle and how they're treated on, on highway conditions and uh, licensing and what have you? Well, in this class, we focus just on our motorcycle riders. Uh, mopeds are not um, allowed to participate in, in this class, per se. Um, but, you know, say someone is a, a moped rider, if they, would, if they wanted to come by and get some pointers, we'd be glad to do that. But as far as this class, it's specific for motorcycle riders. With the new laws uh, concerning mopeds, with them having to have insurance now and be registered, um, there, there are a few more regulations. But a moped is only is restricted in their, their CCs and in how fast they can go. So um, obviously the long ride would, would take significantly longer if we had to follow a moped around town. So, um, but we, we'll be glad to answer any questions and help anybody that's a moped rider. I mean, it's a lot of similarities, but obviously the speed difference is the biggest thing. So any questions, any other questions? All right, at this time, I'll turn it over to Lieutenant John Morris, and he's going to talk about laws regarding ATVs. Good morning. I'm uh, Lieutenant Morris. I'm one of the evening shift field commanders uh, in the city. On April, Sunday, April 29th, we started to receive a lot of uh, calls to our communications division in reference to a large group of all-terrain vehicles, motorcycles, and ATVs riding through the city up to uh, 75 to 100 personnel. Uh, officers were able to locate this group 
on the Greenway entrance at uh, the Hunter Block of Watown Street, uh, where we located a couple of abandoned motorcycles and were able to make uh, two arrests that evening. Um, Marcus Walls from Greensboro, North Carolina, and Mark Quallen Marshall from Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, we found that in this group of uh, ATV riders, a lot of them were for North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia that had congregated in Winston-Salem. Um, our officers, the case remains open to our officers, and they're actively investigating the case right now. As an update, as of, well, the latest one I received last night um, from my other uh, field commander was that uh, we were able to locate and arrest a Richard Allen Davis of Winston-Salem uh, for several charges, and he was cited. And we are also currently looking for a Markel Mason, uh, black male, 817 of 85, out of High Point, North Carolina. Uh, right now, he has six outstanding warrants for arrest, larceny of motor vehicle, and auto break-in and larceny. Um, what we uh, want to push, push forward to the public right now is that the laws regarding the ATVs and the off-road motorcycles that are being ridden on the streets, it is a violation of North Carolina General Statute 20-171.19 subsections E and D, which states to operate. Uh, it's illegal to operate all terrain, all all terrain vehicles on any public street, road, or highways, except for the purposes of crossing that street. Uh, also, subsection D, which states no person shall operate an all terrain vehicle in a careless or reckless manner, which is what we saw on Sunday the 29th. Um, what we'll be doing uh, right after this press release, uh, right after this um, press conference, is pushing out another press release with some pictures of some folks we're trying to identify. Uh, we want to do remind the, the public that if they can identify or they have any information that's they call Crime Stoppers, they are right now are offering up to $5,000 for information that leads to the arrest of any of these individuals. Are there any questions? Thank you, I will turn it over to Officer Ralph Mason. I'm Officer Ralph Mason with the Winston-Salem Police Department. I'm assigned to Specialized Operations Division, currently assigned to the Park Ranger Unit. Thank you all for attending. I've been asked to come up to speak to everybody about some issues that we routinely have in the parks and recreational areas. And one of these uh, issues that we occasionally have to go out and handle disturbances with are at the picnic shelters. The picnic shelters with the City of Winston-Salem Parks and Recreation are not for first come first serve, they're actually for rental. Located on the city link site is the uh, shelter rental uh, instructions that just simply need to be followed. You can either call up st or call downtown at area code 336-727-8000 or 311 to rent those. Just follow the um, directions, they'll prompt you to who you need to get in contact with and they handle those uh, rentals through either cash, debit, credit card payment, and it's accepted down at the um, city revenue site, which is located there in the 100 block of uh, West 1st Street or East 1st Street. Another issue that I routinely get called out to deal with is auto break-ins in the park. Um, we ask our joggers and our visitors that are uh, coming out to enjoy the trailways to uh, not lock their uh, valuables in plain sight in the uh, vehicles. Uh, a lot of these parking spaces are in remote areas in the city. To let y'all know, the uh, city of Winston-Salem owns nearly uh, 3,000 acres of recreational acreage, and um, some of these parking spaces are located in very remote areas, so it's not very hard for somebody to pull into a parking lot uh, walk around, take a look, see what's available, and simply just uh, knock a window out, reach inside, and take what needs to be um, obtained there. Also, uh, another call that I occasionally get is whether or not you can carry a firearm in the uh, city limits in the parks or around the recreational areas. There are some parks that if you are a, uh, a, a legally in possession of a, a CCH permit, you can carry a firearm. Most of these are very remote areas. They're on the bicycle routes and the walking foot trails. Uh, you cannot carry a firearm in a city-owned 
building or city owned uh, around a, an athletic field located under the city ordinance there at 38-10D are a long list of those locations. So if an individual does have a question, if they're going to be visiting a particular park, a particular rec center, prior to going out to that location, we ask them to simply look up the, uh, the city ordinance on that and go down, it's listed. If they do have any questions, they can contact either the Parks and Recreation or contact the police department, ask for a, a park ranger, Ralph Mason. I'll return the call as soon as I can. With um, spring coming upon us, also the city pools are getting ready to open. Uh, currently, the Parks and Recreation are in charge of nine pools, and they're getting ready to open up a new Winston-Salem Aquatic Center. We invite the public to come out for the ribbon cutting, which will be Friday, May the 25th. Also, uh, uh, Bolton Park and Kimberly Park pools will open up on May the 26th. The, the rec center, or excuse me, the park areas are open from a sunrise to sunset. Please pay attention to the uh, rules that are posted. No dogs are to be off a leash unless you're located over at the Washington Park Dog Park. And um, if you've got any questions, please feel free to give myself a call or uh, look on the website. Any questions? Thank you. There are no other questions for the police department. We're gonna ask acting emergency manager, director uh, Robert Reese to come forward. Thank you, Chief Thompson. Good morning. I'm Robert Reese, the acting director for Winston Salem Forsyth County Emergency Management. And uh, I've got a few announcements here I want to make. I want to uh, uh, make you aware that uh, May the 20th through the 26th is National EMS Week. And we would like to say thank you uh, to Forsyth County EMS and all other agencies that do provide uh, EMS type services in our city and county. Uh, you are greatly appreciated. And Next month, June the 22nd through 20, the 24th, there will be a community emergency response team training course located at the Rural Hall Fire Department in Rural Hall. Uh, what this type of training provides is uh, basic skills in the event of a major catastrophe here to where you learn skills such as disaster preparedness, uh, fire safety, basic first aid, and also basic light search skills in case uh, houses in your neighborhood are damaged and you need to try to help your neighbor out. Uh, you can pre-register uh, following the link in terms. Uh, it is on that presentation. If there's any questions, we could be contacted in the office about that. And we are in the middle of Hurricane Preparedness Week. It started on May the 6th and we end on the 12th. And uh, often the question is asked, why do we need to prepare for hurricanes? Uh, but we know occasionally we do get some weather and some uh, issues from that. And the National Weather Service has got a really good program uh, that we can follow. Even though we're in the middle of it, we can either catch up or maybe extend it a little bit on your own. But we do recommend uh, with day one, you determine what are your risks. Uh, we know in our area, uh, we're not uh, prone to all of these risks that they have listed, but we can plan for in inland flooding, strong wind, and also tornadoes. Uh, and by preparing for hurricanes, we also prepare for our other weather events as well. On day two, they want you to develop an evacuation plan. We don't think about this often, but there may be a time when we may have to relocate out of the city and county. Let's go ahead and prepare that. And also, let's pre prepare an evacuation plan so we know where to meet our family and loved ones at locally in case we are separated. On day three, we assemble disaster supplies. Now, if you've been listening to our preparedness speeches for the past several years or more, uh, you may already have some of these in place. If you have a preparedness kit already ready, now is a good time to pull it out and check it just to make sure that the dates on your uh, food items are still good, to make sure the batteries and flashlights work, and that it's still stocked like it should be. On day four, uh, do an insurance checkup. See, see what all your policies cover. Uh, many people still do not realize that you must get a separate policy for flood insurance. So check with your 
your insurance company, or you can always go to floodsmart.gov to get more information as well. On day five, uh, this is uh, going to be a work day, so hopefully the weather will be nice that day, but you do things such as trim trees. Now, we wouldn't typically cover windows here because we can't predict when tornadoes are typical weather events, but take your time to secure doors. Uh, that's uh, something we can do uh, in the case a spontaneous storm were to pop up. Uh, keep your car away from items. Uh, if you have a car that's parked near a basketball goal or something that may easily fall over, for normal practice, you may want to, to relocate that so it's not an issue that you ever have to experience. Uh, also, loose items on patios and decks. If we know that there's a severe weather uh, forecasted for here, let's make sure those items are umbrellas are down and they're secured away. On day six, let's help, help your neighbor. Uh, we always want to uh, make sure we do a good check on the neighbors. We, we want to check for those that may not be able to do such, some of these items, such as being prepared. And also, in the event something does happen, after we're safe and we realize the conditions allow us to move out to our neighbor's house, let's, go be, let's make sure we check on the neighbors, see if there's anything they need. Uh, we want to look for the, the elderly or those that uh, they have disabilities that limit their mobility. Then on day seven, uh, we make a written plan. Uh, We've, we've worked all week, we want to make sure that we don't forget our ideas. And also, uh, it gives us a chance to go back later on, maybe next week, next year, when Hurricane Preparedness week's come, Week comes out again, uh, or severe weather week uh, earlier in the year, and revisit our plan and see if there's any adjustments we need to make to what we currently have. And as always, we ask that you follow us on social media, uh, readyforsites.org, uh, also on Facebook and on Twitter. And if there are any questions, uh, uh, we can be contacted at our office, 767-6161. Uh, we're all taking any questions now at this time. All right, if there are no additional questions for any other agencies, this will conclude the May 2018 Public Safety News Conference. Thank you.